friends, um, welcome. We are privileged to have some time today with Dr. Valerie, Reverend Dr. Valerie Bridgman. We're pleased to welcome her to our community. Dr. Bridgman is at the very least, at the very least, a triple threat. She is a scholar of the Hebrew Bible, she is a distinguished preacher and homiletician, and she is a gifted poet. Even to sit at table with her is to immediately recognize that one is in conversation with a wordsmith with an extraordinary love of language, which I gather she comes by honestly because her mom is an English teacher. A love for the word, written and spoken, informs everything she does, as we shall soon see. Dr. Bridgman has her Master of Divinity degrees from Austin Presby Presbyterian Theological Seminary and her PhD from uh, Baylor, so she knows a thing or two about Texas. <laughs> she is currently working on two books, From God and a Woman, Womanist Hermeneutic for Biblical Interpretation, which is under contract with Westminster John Knox, as well as Hip Hop and the Preacher, a cultural reading of the book of Ecclesiastes. There's much more to be said about her, but we are here to hear from her, rather than just me going on about her. So I will stop. So let's extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Bridgman. Well, so uh, let me be Southern for a moment and go, how you doing? <laughs> Good. As I understand our time, we have about an hour together. I'm going to do about 30 minutes of presentation, give or take a few minutes, and which will leave you with some time to ask some questions. Um, also, as I understand our time, I'm going to do a lecture, but not so much. And by that, I mean this is not like sitting in AAR, SBL, where they're reading a paper to you and then you're you know, supposed to look like you're very interested. Um, try not to do that. Um, so I'm also gonna, I'm, I'm gonna ask you that if you have questions as you hear me talk, to jot them down so that when we get back to them, you won't follow the rabbit trail of somebody else's question and don't get your question answered. How's that for the plan for the rest of the, our time together? You good with that? Yeah. All right. So we have a covenant that you're gonna pay attention. I'm gonna spend a few moments talking. You're gonna ask questions. We're good with that covenant? Okay, let's go. So the title of this lecture is Preaching to Matter. Um, it's actually a part of what has become the core, I think, of my own preaching theology. And I sort of have gotten ingrained with this lecture. It's, not, it's a new lecture. But some of the material is old to me. What has been informing my thinking actually has been three volumes on preaching. One of them is, is titled um, In the Company of Preachers, which uh, Richard Lishner um, is edit edited. What's the Matter with Preaching Today, which Mike Graves edited, which is a take off of an of a, um, essay that appeared in the New York Times in 1925. Uh, by Fosdick, who was, as you know, over at Riverside. And the other one is Birthing the Sermon, which was edited by Jana um, Childers. Those three volumes I, I go back to many times, partly because they are, in fact, very different. So uh, different people talking about their process of preaching, different people writing their theology of preaching all the way back to Augustine, and forward, and what it might mean to be a womanist preacher, what it might mean to be a feminist preacher, all of these things. So I find these volumes great conversation partners. But one of my big conversation partners is actually one of my mentors, which is Renita Wings. Uh, she's an Old Testament professor who is an ordained, ordained AME preacher and grew up Church of God in Christ. So in a lot of ways, although I didn't grow up Church of God in Christ, we have a lot of similarities around playing Bible drills when you were little. I don't know if anybody know anything about what I'm talking about, so don't glaze over if you've never heard of a Bible drill. But 
when I was growing up, what that meant is they gave you a Bible, you had so many seconds to find the scripture and to read it faster than the person down the line, right? Uh, or to memorize. So sometimes it meant that they would call out a scripture to see if you had memorized it. And whoever had memorized it the most in my church, that meant you got peppermint. And, and as we got older, you could get a quarter or 50 cents. You know, it, it came with great uh, rewards. <laughs> so, so, when I, so by the time I went to seminary, in Presbyterian seminaries, you're required to take a Bible content exam. Anybody Presbyterian in here went to a Presbyterian school? You know, so you were required to do this Bible content exam. And so when I was at Austin Seminary, they were feverishly studying for the Bible content exam. And I said, I will not study. I refuse. And they said, oh, that's awfully arrogant of you. I said, if I can't pass a Bible content exam, I'm going home. God did not call me. <laughs> and so they were like, let's see, let's see. And of course, I passed the content exam because I grew up playing Bible drill. And I missed some obscure judge in Judges with 70 sons. Like, I still don't know who that is. <laughs> but that was the one thing. I, it traumatized me. I still didn't go figure out who it was. Um, that, was that was the one thing I missed. But this love of text and how to talk about it and how to preach out of these texts that are blown to the church and of course, I grew up holding this, so my concern for the Old Testament church, I, uh, Old Testament scripture comes out of that, by the way. Most holiness traditions love the Old Testament way, we love God who judges way more than we love the Gospels. <clears throat> this is not a judgment, value judgment. It is an observation and the truth. It's just what I grew up with. And so knowing the stories and loving the stories and questioning the stories. And I had the gift, of course, of a mother who questioned everything. And so my mother was the first person that I had ever heard question the Bible. <sighs> you know, that was like huge in the traditions that I grew up in because I had been told from the pulpit, just believe, don't question God. So how do you learn to preach when you've also learned how to question, right? So this notion of what preaching is began to trouble me because of that question. How do you learn to preach a text that you weren't supposed to question and you learn how to question? So the starting point then became for me, who's at stake? Now this isn't my question. This is a question that comes from Dale Andrews who teaches preaching and social justice at Vanderbilt University. Who's at stake? The preacher who, who begins with the text without thinking at all of the community that will be before her or before him is doing some kind of violence to both the community and the text. Preaching is always in context. Lenore Tubbs Tisdale calls it local theology, right? Local theology and local art. So the preacher that does not know in some way the community to whom she speaks or he speaks does violence, both to the text and to the community. Now, I tried to demonstrate this this morning in my own preaching. I tried to, to demonstrate that I knew something about what it was like to be on a journey in a seminary community. And so if I didn't get that across, I failed miserably. <laughs> but, but that part of who's at stake, who gets heard, who speaks in the text and from the pulpit, who doesn't speak? Who doesn't have voice? How do you take seriously the world of the text uh, as its own? Segovia talks about the world of the text as its own other. You know, how do you take that seriously, having its own voice and its own history? The text has its own voice, voices, and its own history, its own redactions, its own retellings. It is not one book, and this, of course, is the great heresy of the church, treating the Bible like it's one book, as opposed to many books with many stories, sometimes competing stories, sometimes competing theologies. How do you preach from a book that has competing theologies? Well, you have to take into, con uh, have to take into consideration who is at stake. 
So one of the ways that Renita Williams, I mentioned her, one of the ways Renita Williams talks about it is this. She wrote an essay on what will they say about our preaching, speaking about women coming into the 21st century. And it was published, first of all, uh, in the African American pulpit, which is now defunct, but, it, but you can find it on her website. She published it on her website in 2007, something within. What's, what will they say about women preachers? What will they say about us? And she may, I'm gonna read this quote. How can we preach for years and never bring up domestic violence, sexual abuse, the kidnapping of girls that take place every week in our cities? What will it say about us, meaning women, if we master the art of preaching but never figure out a way to persuade audiences to see God as more than Father? If we insist upon our right to preach, only to preach a gospel of prosperity and say nothing about war and systemic poverty, what was the point? If God is as terrifying and punitive in our preaching as God has been construed by previous generations of preachers, if men are not offered new modes of manhood and women are not offered new life-giving ways of being whole and holy vessels of God, if hierarchy and patriarchy continue to define the way the church does business, then what difference will it have made that women outnumbered men in seminary in the 21st century? What difference will it make? So what matters is who. Who's preaching, who's speaking, who's listening, who are the subjects of our sermons? Now, of course, if I was being deeply theological, you know, if I wanted to be, not be a heretic, which I'm not sure I don't want to be a heretic, so I will, I will confess that, um, then I would say, of course, you're always speaking of God, because that's what you're supposed to say. But the truth of the matter is, if you're preaching in a congregation and the people don't believe that you know them or care about them or know where they live deeply, then you get the glazed over look and they say amen at all the right places. They walk out, give you that limp shake at the end, good sermon preacher. And, you know, and then they go into their lives and nothing you say trails into their life with them because you have not taken seriously who they are. Who matters? The materiality of our lives, the ways in which we show up in the world, matters to the preacher. It must matter to the preacher. <clears throat> I suppose then that I am troubling the question of starting point. For preaching is often called biblical preaching. The notion, of course, is that if you're doing biblical preaching, you're starting with a biblical text. But I, I wonder about that. I wonder if, you, if biblical preaching isn't preaching like the prophets preached, which is to say, do what Hab Habakkuk did, which is take a watch, look at the world, talk about how evil it is to God, and then say to God, I'm gonna stand on my watch post and station myself on the rampart, and I'm going to keep watch to see what you're going to do and what you're going to say. So the starting point of listening for the voice of God is not digging into some text, but digging into the lives around us and taking that to God and taking that to the text, right? The rabbi Margaret Winnick talks about it like this. Over the tabernacle in... Um, most synagogues or temples, the words, uh, know before whom you stand. Know before whom you stand. Or over the ark. Right? And she says um, that it means at least three things, and I agree with her about this. Know before whom you stand. Know before whom you stand. The first is know yourself. Preachers are notoriously bad at using the pulpit for their therapy. <laughs> Spewing out on the people their own fears and concerns without having navigated or excavated their own lives to figure out 
what that is. Dr. James Forbes said to us at the Proctor about three years ago, your first job is to excavate your own life. Did I do it? <laughs> That's your first job. Your first job is to excavate your own life, to find the points of tension inside you, to figure out what's going on with you when you approach a text. This is why I ask uh, students to do Lecta Divina with a text, to read it out loud, to read it out loud several times, to read it in several different places, and to find that place where it troubles you, where it irritates you, where it bores you, to try to figure out the kinds of questions that are coming up from within you that have nothing whatsoever to do with the text. Those are valid questions. They are absolute valid questions because you're gonna stand before people and if you don't know what your own questions are, how will you address anyone else's? Now, addressing your questions in preaching is not sufficient, but you ought to at least know what they are. You, you need to at least have some sense of what they are. The second one I've already kind of talked about when she says, know before whom you stand. Know the people who are sitting in front of you. Have some sense of their concerns, their angst, their joys. Um, when I pastored, uh, one of the things that I used to do as a preacher, I, I pastored with several pastors and we had a um, multi-racial congregation in Austin, Texas. So for all of what that means, think about that. Um, but one of the things I used to do is I would call people in the, in the community or I would talk to them after church in preparation for the next week and I would say, this is the text for next week. I want you to read it with me. Tell me what you think. Tell me what images come up for you. Tell me what questions you have. Help me out. I need your help. And I would check with the young people and I'd say, if I say this, how will that sound? And they, and they would tell me. That sounds like you're trying to be cool, and we will know you're trying to be cool, but you're not. Don't do that. Uh, <laughs> or they would say, that doesn't mean what you think it means. I promise you. <laughs> you know, and that, but, t but rather than assuming that I knew them, I asked them, who are you? Who's sitting in front of me? What are your concerns as you see this, as you think about this? What's going on in your world? So for example, when I was at, in Memphis, uh, I, I, both in Austin and in Memphis, I worked with gangs, and quite by accident worked with gangs. Dr. Al Yu is here, he knows this is true. And they would, be, they would come to my office, they would, I mean, they would just show up, rough crew. And <laughs> they really were. And so one time, I, somebody asked one of the guys, why, well they asked me, and some of the guys were around me, and they said, why are, why are the young people always around you? And I said, I actually don't know the answer to that. And one of the young men said, because you're the only adult that looks us in the face and smile. You're the only person that treats us like we're human. You're the only person that cares about what we care about. You're the only person that doesn't get up and preach to us about sex every Sunday. One of the guys said to me, I never think about sex so much as when I come to church. Because they're, all, because they're always preaching, don't, don't, don't. He's like, I'm trying to figure out how to survive on the street. I'm trying to figure out how not to get shot. And so if you're preaching to a group and you're not touching the place where they are, the deep place where they are, are you really preaching? And then finally she says, know before whom you stand, you stand before God, Right? So if preaching is anything, it is this conversation between heaven and earth, between the mystery and the mundane, right? Be between God and, and humans. And in the Christian tradition, what that means is it is an incarnational act, right? It, it is this moment where flesh is, where the word is enfleshed and made visible to the people that are preaching. You, you dare to say, this is what God is saying, right? Thus saith the Lord in, in King James parlance. Thus saith the Lord. How bold and foolish is that? Which is why Paul calls it the foolishness of preaching, right? Because you're daring to speak on behalf of this ethereal around here that nobody ever has to believe you've heard from God. How do people dare believe us 
What kind of authenticity must we bear in order to have authority? This is what Fred Craddock talks about. We come as authority because we come out of the community, not because we have been endowed with community, I mean authority because we are called. Many are called, few are chosen. A whole lot of people heard something. <laughs> but it is the community that bears witness to a sound deeper than just your voice. You know, the sound of many waters. The voice of God is like the sound of many waters, deep, calling to deep, the psalmist calls it. It's that moment when you can be speaking and 30 people will say, you were speaking just to me. You've had that experience, right? A feeling as if the preacher was talking just to you or having someone say to you, you were talking just to me. But of course, when you're struggling, when you're wrestling with these texts, when you're wrestling with the community before the text, you personally have no idea whether it's God. I'm, I confess, I've gone to the pulpit and said, I know this is a word from God, but I say that in faith. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, you have to. The community has to bear witness to whether it's the word from God. That's why when preachers are trying to force people to say amen to them, I'm like, yeah, no, they ain't with you. <laughs> <laughs> they don't hear anything deep. They don't hear anything of the sound of God from you. That's not what they're hearing. So this paying attention to knowing, know before whom you stand, is, I think, at core of this preaching uh, local theology and folk art that Tubbs Tisdale talks about. It is the way in which we enter into conversation with God and with one another. It's the way that we bring in the popular culture with us, the way we talk about uh, what other people are talking about and take it from profane, meaning only by the, what the word profane really means, which is from outside the church, and bringing it into holy space. So for example, I, I lived in Memphis when when um, the movie, Lord, just went out of my head, but the song, It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp, was Hustle and Flow. See, this is, this is how I like lectures, because I know everybody in here can get with me one place or another, right? So my godson made me go see Hustle and Flow, made me, and I do mean made me, as in put me in the car, mama, you have to go, bought the ticket, and I went and rolled my eyes the whole time on the way to the movie, right? Like, it was beneath me, right? But there's this moment in the, in the story where the, the musician who is helping his pimp friend, right? His wife, there's tension between him and his wife. And he insists on going down to the whorehouse, that's what they call it, to help his friend do this mixtape. And she's sitting at the table with food spread alone. And the, the sun is streaming through, so this very holy moment, her arms folded in prayer. And she looks up, and you don't hear. There's no, oh, no music to make you know that God is present or anything. But the next scene is she has gathered the food up in a picnic basket, taken it down to the whorehouse, and offered it to the women, her husband, and the pimp. And they have communion in that moment. She takes it beyond her own personal theology and says, essentially she said, well, he's going to be down here with the hoes, me too. <laughs> I mean, that's what she says. But on a deeper level, she says, this might in fact be where God is. So I preach this, right? And the young people are standing up on the back. They just get up out their seat. Y'all go, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> scream, scream, and screaming at me, you know, because I've connected for them this place where God is in the world they know. I didn't say to them, stay in the whorehouse. I mean, that's not even the point. The point is, where are the points of connection that people can get with you and get with God, right? 
So it's a part of this interpretive process where you bring the text, the ancient text, which lives in its own kind of way, in its own kind of world, you bring it into the lives of those who are engaging it. And if you never do that, you have not preached. You just haven't preached if you never do that. So who matters? But also what matters? Now, I often say to students that I'm working on making you really good heretics. <laughs> and what I mean by that is challenging the boundaries, pushing the boundaries of God's love as far as you can, instead of closing the gate, widening the space. Most people are afraid of that. How wide, how deep is God's grace? How wide, how deep? is God's grace? How welcoming is God? What does the commonwealth of God look like? What is an absurd vision of shalom for God? Well, I said this the other day, the, uh, the absurdest vision I can see is a wolf laying down with a lamb, a child playing over a snake's pit. These are dangerous things, and yet in this vision of the peaceable kingdom, somehow what is most dangerous ceases to be. And so the preacher creates a vision of what God wants in the world and is essentially looking over God's shoulder to describe that for people. Prophetic preaching is not just cataloging all the ills of the world. That's easy. That's called cynicism. I do it every day. Prophetic preaching is seeing what's wrong with the world and imagining and envisioning something much better and much more full, much more like God than we can believe. This is why Hebrews tells us that we don't forsake the getting together. It's why, so we can provoke each other to love. We can outdo each other. We can compete with each other in the area of love and doing the works of God in the world, right? But if you're not with people to hear that word spoken, and if the preacher can't get a vision of a better world, then you will leave the way you came. And nothing will matter to you. This is why I start praying, let everything that can be shaken, shake. So that the only thing that remains is something worth building on, right? I grew up in Tornado Alley in Alabama, so that means something real to me when I say let everything be destroyed that can be destroyed because I have seen tornadoes take out space and people and places. And sometimes that is the way preaching works. Last three things, and then I will open up for questions. Um, but I'm a preacher, so that may not actually be my last three things. <laughs> I came out of the Baptist tradition, you close three times. Um, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, okay. Um, so preaching has to be sensory, right? It has, to, it has to touch, this is what sellers mean, and what Barbara Brown Taylor means, when it's, it has to touch all the senses. You have to feel and see. This is what I was trying to suggest when I said the voice was in the rustling of the leaves this morning, that you could hear rustling leaves. You know what that sounds like, right? Uh, the, the grumbling of a stomach, you know what that sounds like. So it's the touch, it's the sound, it's the voice, it's all of that. And preaching that is didactic, da, 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 but does not proclaim it really doesn't give us anything to work with. The preaching isn't the amen, it's the beginning of the week. It's the eighth day, it's the recreation moment where you start over a new creation and the word trails you into the world and maybe it runs out about Thursday or Friday. <laughs> and, and you know, the perfume smell of it is gone and then you come back both to word and table, right? That because the word is not meant, it's not a one-time feeling and it's not even teaching as much as it is 
this I believe, this I proclaim. What my eyes have seen, what my, this is what 1 John 1 says, right? What my eyes have seen, what my ears have heard, what my hands have touched. That's what I share with you. That's what I proclaim with you. And so the preacher who hasn't seen, felt, touched anything gets up and nothing. And the people nod and shake your hand and go about their daily business. So in that sense, Tom Long is right that preaching is testimony. Marvin McMichael is right that preaching is a telling of one's own soul. Anna Carter Florence is right that preaching is about salvation, but it's not this individual save your soul thing. It literally is, how shall I have a real life? How shall I have a life that is real? So when the young uh, ruler comes to Jesus and uh, the young lawyer comes to Jesus and says, what's the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus says, you read the law, you interpret it. So this is why I know preaching is interpretation, right? You can't just say, well, the Bible said it, I believe it, that sells it. No, the Bible has to be interpreted in this moment, in this time with these people. He said, well, it says love God and these people. And Jesus said, that's good. Go do that and you'll live. 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 So the word here is that preaching brings us to life. It's not what law will keep me inside the lines. It's what will, he said, go do that and live. But the young lawyer, like us, said, okay, where are the lines, though? But who's my neighbor? Like, really, give me.